Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 24 Valancy herself made Sissy ready for burial. No hands but hers should touch that pitiful, wasted little body. The old house was spotless on the day of the funeral. Barney Snaith was not there. He had done all he could to help Valancy before it, he had shrouded the pale Cecilia in white roses from the garden, and then had gone back to his island. But everybody else was there. All Deerwood and up back came. They forgave Sissy splendidly at last. Mr. Bradley gave a very beautiful funeral address. Valancy had wanted her old free Methodist man, but Roaring Abel was obdurate. He was a Presbyterian and no one but a Presbyterian minister should bury his daughter. Mr. Bradley was very tactful. He avoided all dubious points and it was plain to be seen he hoped for the best. Six reputable citizens of Deerwood bore Cecilia Gay to her grave in decorous Deerwood Cemetery. Among them was Uncle Wellington. The Stirlings all came to the funeral, men and women. They had had a family conclave over it. Surely now that Sissy Gay was dead Valancy would come home. She simply could not stay there with Roaring Abel. That being the case, the wisest course, decreed Uncle James, was to attend the funeral, legitimized the whole thing, so to speak, show Deerwood that Valancy had really done a most creditable deed in going to nurse poor Cecilia Gay and that her family backed her up in it. Death, the miracle worker, suddenly made the thing quite respectable. If Valancy would return to home and decency while public opinion was under its influence all might yet be well. Society was suddenly forgetting all Cecilia's wicked doings and remembering what a pretty, modest little thing she had been, and motherless, you know, motherless. It was the psychological moment, said Uncle James. So the Stirlings went to the funeral. Even cousin Gladys Neuritis allowed her to come. Cousin Stickles was there, her bonnet dripping all over her face, crying as woefully as if Sissy had been her nearest and dearest. Funerals always brought Cousin Stickles' own sad bereavement back. And Uncle Wellington was a pallbearer. Valancy, pale, subdued looking, her slanted eyes smudged with purple, in her snuff brown dress, moving quietly about, finding seats for people, consulting in undertones with minister and undertaker, marshalling the mourners into the parlor, was so decorous and proper and sterlingish that her family took heart of grace. This was not, could not be, the girl who had sat all night in the woods with Barney Snaith, who had gone tearing bareheaded through Deerwood and Port Lawrence. This was the Valancy they knew. Really, surprisingly capable and efficient. Perhaps she had always been kept down a bit too much, Amelia really was rather strict, hadn't had a chance to show what was in her. So thought the Stirlings. And Edward Beck from the Port Road, a widower with a large family who was beginning to take notice, took notice of Valancy and thought she might make a mighty fine second wife. No beauty, but a fifty-year-old widower, Mr. Beck told himself very reasonably, couldn't expect everything. Altogether, it seemed that Valancy's matrimonial chances were never so bright as they were at Cecilia Gay's funeral. What the Stirlings and Edward Beck would have thought had they known the back of Valancy's mind must be left to the imagination. Valancy was hating the funeral, hating the people who came to stare with curiosity at Cecilia's marble-white face, hating the smugness, hating the dragging, melancholy singing, hating Mr. Bradley's cautious platitudes. If she could have had her absurd way, there would have been no funeral at all. She would have covered Sissy over with flowers, shut her away from prying eyes, and buried her beside her nameless little baby in the grassy burying ground under the pines of the up-back church, with a bit of kindly prayer from the old free Methodist minister. She remembered Sissy saying once, I wish I could be buried deep in the heart of the woods where nobody would ever come to say, Sissy Gay is buried here, and tell over my miserable story. 
But this. However, it would soon be over. Valancy knew, if the Sterlings and Edward Beck didn't, exactly what she intended to do then. She had lain awake all the preceding night thinking about it and finally deciding on it. When the funeral procession had left the house, Mrs. Frederick sought out Valancy in the kitchen. My child, she said tremulously, you'll come home now? Home, said Valancy absently. She was getting on an apron and calculating how much tea she must put to steep for supper. There would be several guests from up back, distant relatives of the gays who had not remembered them for years. And she was so tired she wished she could borrow a pair of legs from the cat. Yes, home, said Mrs. Frederick, with a touch of asperity. I suppose you won't dream of staying here now, alone with Roaring Abel. Oh, no, I'm not going to stay here, said Valancy. Of course, I'll have to stay for a day or two, to put the house in order generally. But that will be all. Excuse me, mother, won't you? I've a frightful lot to do, all those, up back, people will be here to supper. Mrs. Frederick retreated in considerable relief, and the Sterlings went home with lighter hearts. We will just treat her as if nothing had happened when she comes back, decreed Uncle Benjamin. That will be the best plan. Just as if nothing had happened. Chapter 25 On the evening of the day after the funeral Roaring Abel went off for a spree. He had been sober for four whole days and could endure it no longer. Before he went, Valancy told him she would be going away the next day. Roaring Abel was sorry, and said so. A distant cousin from up back was coming to keep house for him, quite willing to do so now since there was no sick girl to wait on, but Abel was not under any delusions concerning her. She won't be like you, my girl. Well, I'm obliged to you. You helped me out of a bad hole and I won't forget it. And I won't forget what you did for Sissy. I'm your friend and if you ever want any of the sterlings spanked and sought in a corner send for me. I'm going to wet my whistle. Lord, but I'm dry. Don't reckon I'll be back afore tomorrow night, so if you're going home tomorrow, goodbye now. I may go home tomorrow, said Valancy, but I'm not going back to Deerwood. Not going, you'll find the key on the woodshed nail, interrupted Valancy, politely and unmistakably. The dog will be in the barn and the cat in the cellar. Don't forget to feed her till your cousin comes. The pantry is full and I made bread and pies today. Goodbye, Mr. Gay. You have been very kind to me and I appreciate it. We've had a d, d decent time of it together, and that's a fact, said Roaring Abel. You're the best small sport in the world, and your little finger is worth the whole Sterling clan tied together. Goodbye and good luck. Valancy went out to the garden. Her legs trembled a little, but otherwise she felt and looked composed. She held something tightly in her hand. The garden was lying in the magic of the warm, odorous July twilight. A few stars were out and the robins were calling through the velvety silences of the barrens. Valancy stood by the gate expectantly. Would he come? If he did not, he was coming. Valancy heard Lady Jane Grey far back in the woods. Her breath came a little more quickly. Nearer, and nearer, she could see Lady Jane now, bumping down the lane, nearer, nearer, he was there, he had sprung from the car and was leaning over the gate, looking at her. Going home, Miss Sterling? I don't know, yet, said Valancy slowly. Her mind was made up, with no shadow of turning, but the moment was very tremendous. I thought I'd run down and ask if there was anything I could do for you, said Barney. Valancy took it with a canter. Yes, there is something you can do for me, she said, evenly and distinctly. Will you marry me? For a moment Barney was silent. There was no particular expression on his face. Then he gave an odd laugh. Come, now. I knew luck was just waiting around the corner for me. All the signs have been pointing that way today. Wait. Valancy lifted her hand. I'm in earnest, 
but I want to get my breath after that question. Of course, with my bringing up, I realize perfectly well that this is one of the things a lady should not do. But why, why? For two reasons. Valancy was still a little breathless, but she looked Barney straight in the eyes, while all the dead sterlings revolved rapidly in their graves and the living ones did nothing because they did not know that Valancy was at that moment proposing lawful marriage to the notorious Barney Snaith. The first reason is, I, I, Valancy tried to say, I love you, but could not. She had to take refuge in a pretended flippancy. I'm crazy about you. The second is, this. She handed him Dr. Trent's letter. Barney opened it with the air of a man thankful to find some safe, sane thing to do. As he read it his face changed. He understood, more perhaps than Valancy wanted him to. Are you sure nothing can be done for you? Valancy did not misunderstand the question. Yes. You know Dr. Trent's reputation in regard to heart disease. I haven't long to live, perhaps only a few months, a few weeks. I want to live them. I can't go back to Deerwood, you know what my life was like there. And, she managed it this time, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. That's all. Barney folded his arms on the gate and looked gravely enough at a white, saucy star that was winking at him just over Roaring Abel's kitchen chimney. You don't know anything about me. I may be a, murderer. No, I don't. You may be something dreadful. Everything they say of you may be true. But it doesn't matter to me. You care that much for me, Valancy, said Barney incredulously, looking away from the star and into her eyes, her strange, mysterious eyes. I care, that much, said Valancy in a low voice. She was trembling. He had called her by her name for the first time. It was sweeter than another man's caress could have been just to hear him say her name like that. If we are going to get married, said Barney, speaking suddenly in a casual, matter-of-fact voice, some things must be understood. Everything must be understood, said Valancy. I have things I want to hide, said Barney coolly. You are not to ask me about them. I won't, said Valancy. You must never ask to see my mail. Never. And we are never to pretend anything to each other. We won't, said Valancy. You won't even have to pretend you like me. If you marry me I know you're only doing it out of pity. And we'll never tell a lie to each other about anything, a big lie or a petty lie. Especially a petty lie, agreed Valancy. And you'll have to live back on my island. I won't live anywhere else. That's partly why I want to marry you, said Valancy. Barney peered at her. I believe you mean it. Well, let's get married, then. Thank you, said Valancy, with a sudden return of primness. She would have been much less embarrassed if he had refused her. I suppose I haven't any right to make conditions. But I'm going to make one. You are never to refer to my heart or my liability to sudden death. You are never to urge me to be careful. You are to forget, absolutely forget, that I'm not perfectly healthy. I have written a letter to my mother, here it is, you are to keep it. I have explained everything in it. If I drop dead suddenly, as I likely will do, it will exonerate me in the eyes of your kindred from the suspicion of having poisoned you, said Barney with a grin. Exactly. Valancy laughed gaily. Dear me, I'm glad this is over. It has been, a bit of an ordeal. You see, I'm not in the habit of going about asking men to marry me. It is so nice of you not to refuse me, or offer to be a brother. I'll go to the port tomorrow and get a license. We can be married tomorrow evening. Dr. Stalling, I suppose? Heavens, no. Valancy shuddered. Besides, he wouldn't do it. He'd shake his forefinger at me and I'd jilt you at the altar. No, I want my old Mr. Towers to marry me. 
Will you marry me as I stand? demanded Barney. A passing car, full of tourists, honked loudly, it seemed derisively. Valency looked at him. Blue homespun shirt, nondescript hat, muddy overalls. Unshaved. Yes, she said. Barney put his hands over the gate and took her little, cold ones gently in his. Valency, he said, trying to speak lightly, of course I'm not in love with you, never thought of such a thing as being in love. But, do you know, I've always thought you were a bit of a dear. Chapter 26 The next day passed for Valency like a dream. She could not make herself or anything she did seem real. She saw nothing of Barney, though she expected he must go rattling past on his way to the port for a license. Perhaps he had changed his mind. But at dusk the lights of Lady Jane suddenly swooped over the crest of the wooded hill beyond the lane. Valency was waiting at the gate for her bridegroom. She wore her green dress and her green hat because she had nothing else to wear. She did not look or feel at all bride-like, she really looked like a wild elf straight out of the greenwood. But that did not matter. Nothing at all mattered except that Barney was coming for her. Ready, said Barney, stopping Lady Jane with some new, horrible noises. Yes. Valancy stepped in and sat down. Barney was in his blue shirt and overalls. But they were clean overalls. He was smoking a villainous-looking pipe and he was bareheaded. But he had a pair of oddly smart boots on under his shabby overalls. And he was shaved. They clattered into Deerwood and through Deerwood and hit the long, wooded road to the port. Haven't changed your mind, said Barney. No. Have you? No. That was their whole conversation on the fifteen miles. Everything was more dreamlike than ever. Valency didn't know whether she felt happy. Or terrified. Or just plain fool. Then the lights of Port Lawrence were about them. Valency felt as if she were surrounded by the gleaming, hungry eyes of hundreds of great, stealthy panthers. Barney briefly asked where Mr. Towers lived, and Valency as briefly told him. They stopped before the shabby little house in an unfashionable street. They went into the small, shabby parlor. Barney produced his license. So he had got it. Also a ring. This thing was real. She, Valancy Sterling, was actually on the point of being married. They were standing up together before Mr. Towers. Valancy heard Mr. Towers and Barney saying things. She heard some other person saying things. She herself was thinking of the way she had once planned to be married, away back in her early teens when such a thing had not seemed impossible. White silk and tulle veil and orange blossoms, no bridesmaid. But one flower girl, in a frock of cream shadow lace over pale pink, with a wreath of flowers in her hair, carrying a basket of roses and lilies of the valley. And the groom, a noble-looking creature, irreproachably clad in whatever the fashion of the day decreed. Valancy lifted her eyes and saw herself and Barney in the little, slanting, distorting mirror over the mantelpiece. She in her odd, unbridled green hat and dress, Barney in shirt and overalls. But it was Barney. That was all that mattered. No veil, no flowers, no guests, no presents, no wedding cake, but just Barney. For all the rest of her life there would be Barney. Mrs. Snaith, I hope you will be very happy, Mr. Towers was saying. He had not seemed surprised at their appearance, not even at Barney's overalls. He had seen plenty of queer weddings up back. He did not know Valancy was one of the Deerwood Sterlings, he did not even know there were Deerwood Sterlings. He did not know Barney Snaith was a fugitive from justice. Really, he was an incredibly ignorant old man. Therefore he married them and gave them his blessing very gently and solemnly and prayed for them that night after they had gone away. His conscience did not trouble him at all. What a nice way to get married. Barney was saying as he put Lady Jane in gear. No fuss and flub-dub. 
I never supposed it was half so easy. For heaven's sake, said Valancy suddenly, let's forget we are married and talk as if we weren't. I can't stand another drive like the one we had coming in. Barney howled and threw Lady Jane into high with an infernal noise. And I thought I was making it easy for you, he said. You didn't seem to want to talk. I didn't. But I wanted you to talk. I don't want you to make love to me, but I want you to act like an ordinary human being. Tell me about this island of yours. What sort of a place is it? The jolliest place in the world. You're going to love it. The first time I saw it I loved it. Old Tom McMurray owned it then. He built the little shack on it, lived there in winter and rented it to Toronto people in summer. I bought it from him, became by that one simple transaction a landed proprietor owning a house and an island. There is something so satisfying in owning a whole island. And isn't an uninhabited island a charming idea? I'd wanted to own one ever since I'd read Robinson Crusoe. It seemed too good to be true. And beauty. Most of the scenery belongs to the government, but they don't tax you for looking at it, and the moon belongs to everybody. You won't find my shack very tidy. I suppose you'll want to make it tidy. Yes, said Valancy honestly. I have to be tidy. I don't really want to be. But untidiness hurts me. Yes, I'll have to tidy up your shack. I was prepared for that, said Barney, with a hollow groan. But, continued Valancy relentingly, I won't insist on your wiping your feet when you come in. No, you'll only sweep up after me with the air of a martyr, said Barney. Well, anyway, you can't tidy the lean-to. You can't even enter it. The door will be locked and I shall keep the key. Bluebeard's chamber, said Valancy. I shan't even think of it. I don't care how many wives you have hanging up in it. So long as they're really dead. Dead as doornails. You can do as you like in the rest of the house. There's not much of it, just one big living room and one small bedroom. Well built, though. Old Tom loved his job. The beams of our house are cedar and the rafters fir. Our living room windows face west and east. It's wonderful to have a room where you can see both sunrise and sunset. I have two cats there. Banjo and good luck. Adorable animals. Banjo is a big, enchanting, gray devil cat. Striped, of course. I don't care a hang for any cat that hasn't stripes. I never knew a cat who could swear as genteelly and effectively as Banjo. His only fault is that he snores horribly when he is asleep. Luck is a dainty little cat. Always looking wistfully at you, as if he wanted to tell you something. Maybe he will pull it off sometime. Once in a thousand years, you know, one cat is allowed to speak. My cats are philosophers, neither of them ever cries over spilt milk. Two old crows live in a pine tree on the point and are reasonably neighborly. Call M. Nip and Tuck. And I have a demure little tame owl. Name, Leander. I brought him up from a baby and he lives over on the mainland and chuckles to himself oh nights. And bats, it's a great place for bats at night. Scared of bats? No, I like them. So do I, nice, queer, uncanny, mysterious creatures. Coming from nowhere, going nowhere. Swoop. Banjo likes M, too. Eats M. I have a canoe and a disappearing propeller boat. Went to the port in it today to get my license. Quieter than Lady Jane. I thought you hadn't gone at all, that you had changed your mind, admitted Valancy. Barney laughed, the laugh Valancy did not like, the little, bitter, cynical laugh. I never change my mind, he said shortly. They went back through Deerwood. Up the Muskoka Road. Past Roaring Abel's. Over the rocky, daisied lane. The dark pine woods swallowed them up. 
Through the pine woods, where the air was sweet with the incense of the unseen, fragile bells of the Linneas that carpeted the banks of the trail. Out to the shore of Mistawis. Lady Jane must be left here. They got out. Barney led the way down a little path to the edge of the lake. There's our island, he said gloatingly. Valancy looked, and looked, and looked again. There was a diaphanous, lilac mist on the lake, shrouding the island. Through it the two enormous pine trees that clasped hands over Barney's shack loomed out like dark turrets. Behind them was a sky still rose-hued in the afterlight, and a pale young moon. Valancy shivered like a tree the wind stirs suddenly. Something seemed to sweep over her soul. My blue castle, she said. Oh, my blue castle. They got into the canoe and paddled out to it. They left behind the realm of everyday and things known and landed on a realm of mystery and enchantment where anything might happen, anything might be true. Barney lifted Valancy out of the canoe and swung her to a lichen-covered rock under a young pine tree. His arms were about her and suddenly his lips were on hers. Valancy found herself shivering with the rapture of her first kiss. Welcome home, dear, Barney was saying. Chapter 27 Cousin Georgiana came down the lane leading up to her little house. She lived half a mile out of Deerwood and she wanted to go into Amelia's and find out if Doss had come home yet. Cousin Georgiana was anxious to see Doss. She had something very important to tell her. Something, she was sure, Doss would be delighted to hear. Poor Doss. She had had rather a dull life of it. Cousin Georgiana owned to herself that she would not like to live under Amelia's thumb. But that would be all changed now. Cousin Georgiana felt tremendously important. For the time being, she quite forgot to wonder which of them would go next. And here was Doss herself, coming along the road from Roaring Abel's in such a queer green dress and hat. Talk about luck. Cousin Georgiana would have a chance to impart her wonderful secret right away, with nobody else about to interrupt. It was, you might say, a providence. Valancy, who had been living for four days on her enchanted island, had decided that she might as well go into Deerwood and tell her relatives that she was married. Otherwise, finding that she had disappeared from Roaring Abel's, they might get out a search warrant for her. Barney had offered to drive her in, but she had preferred to go alone. She smiled very radiantly at cousin Georgiana, who, she remembered, as of someone known a long time ago, had really been not a bad little creature. Valancy was so happy that she could have smiled at anybody, even Uncle James. She was not averse to cousin Georgiana's company. Already, since the houses along the road were becoming numerous, she was conscious that curious eyes were looking at her from every window. I suppose you're going home, dear Doss, said cousin Georgiana as she shook hands, furtively eyeing Valancy's dress and wondering if she had any petticoat on at all. Sooner or later, said Valancy cryptically. Then I'll go along with you. I've been wanting to see you very especially, Doss dear. I've something quite wonderful to tell you. Yes, said Valancy absently. What on earth was cousin Georgiana looking so mysterious and important about? But did it matter? No. Nothing mattered but Barney and the blue castle up back in Mistawis. Who do you suppose called to see me the other day? asked cousin Georgiana archly. Valancy couldn't guess. Edward Beck. Cousin Georgiana lowered her voice almost to a whisper. Edward Beck. Why the italics? And was cousin Georgiana blushing? Who on earth is Edward Beck? asked Valancy indifferently. Cousin Georgiana stared. Surely you remember Edward Beck, she said reproachfully. He lives in that lovely house on the Port Lawrence Road and he comes to our church, regularly. You must remember him. Oh, I think I do now, said Valancy, with an effort of memory. He's that old man with a one on his forehead and dozens of children, who always sits in the pew by the door, 
isn't he? Not dozens of children, dear, oh, no, not dozens. Not even one dozen. Only nine. At least only nine that count. The rest are dead. He isn't old, he's only about forty-eight, the prime of life, Doss, and what does it matter about a one? Nothing, of course, agreed Valency quite sincerely. It certainly did not matter to her whether Edward Beck had a one or a dozen wens or no one at all. But Valency was getting vaguely suspicious. There was certainly an air of suppressed triumph about Cousin Georgiana. Could it be possible that Cousin Georgiana was thinking of marrying again? Marrying Edward Beck? Absurd. Cousin Georgiana was sixty-five if she were a day and her little anxious face was as closely covered with fine wrinkles as if she had been a hundred. But still, my dear, said Cousin Georgiana, Edward Beck wants to marry you. Valency stared at Cousin Georgiana for a moment. Then she wanted to go off into a peal of laughter. But she only said, me? Yes, you. He fell in love with you at the funeral. And he came to consult me about it. I was such a friend of his first wife, you know. He is very much in earnest, Dossie. And it's a wonderful chance for you. He's very well off, and you know, you, you, I am not so young as I once was, agreed Valency. To her that hath shall be given. Do you really think I would make a good stepmother, cousin Georgiana? I'm sure you would. You were always so fond of children. But nine is such a family to start with, objected Valency gravely. The two oldest are grown up and the third almost. That leaves only six that really count. And most of them are boys. So much easier to bring up than girls. There's an excellent book, Health Care of the Growing Child, Gladys has a copy, I think. It would be such a help to you. And there are books about morals. You'd manage nicely. Of course I told Mr. Beck that I thought you would, would, jump at him, supplied Valency. Oh, no, no, dear. I wouldn't use such an indelicate expression. I told him I thought you would consider his proposal favorably. And you will, won't you, dearie? There's only one obstacle, said Valency dreamily. You see, I'm married already. Married? Cousin Georgiana stopped stock still and stared at Valency. Married? Yes. I was married to Barney Snaith last Tuesday evening in Port Lawrence. There was a convenient gatepost hard by. Cousin Georgiana took firm hold of it. Doss, dear, I'm an old woman, are you trying to make fun of me? Not at all. I'm only telling you the truth. For heaven's sake, Cousin Georgiana, Valency was alarmed by certain symptoms, don't go crying here on the public road. Cousin Georgiana choked back the tears and gave a little moan of despair instead. Oh, Doss, what have you done? What have you done? I've just been telling you. I've got married, said Valency, calmly and patiently. To that, that, ah, uh, that, Barney Snaith. Why, they say he's had a dozen wives already. I'm the only one round at present, said Valency. What will your poor mother say, moaned cousin Georgiana. Come along with me in here, if you want to know, said Valency. I'm on my way to tell her now. Cousin Georgiana let go the gatepost cautiously and found that she could stand alone. She meekly trotted on beside Valency, who suddenly seemed quite a different person in her eyes. Cousin Georgiana had a tremendous respect for a married woman. But it was terrible to think of what the poor girl had done. So rash. So reckless. Of course Valency must be stark mad. But she seemed so happy in her madness that cousin Georgiana had a momentary conviction that it would be a pity if the clan tried to scold her back to sanity. She had never seen that look in Valency's eyes before. But what would Amelia say? And Ben? To marry a man you know nothing about, thought cousin Georgiana aloud. 
I know more about him than I know of Edward Beck, said Valency. Edward Beck goes to church, said cousin Georgiana. Does Barr, does your husband? He has promised that he will go with me on fine Sundays, said Valency. When they turned in at the Stirling Gate Valency gave an exclamation of surprise. Look at my rosebush. Why, it's blooming. It was. Covered with blossoms. Great, crimson, velvety blossoms. Fragrant. Glowing. Wonderful. My cutting it to pieces must have done it good, said Valency, laughing. She gathered a handful of the blossoms, they would look well on the supper table of the veranda at Mistawi's, and went, still laughing, up the walk, conscious that Olive was standing on the steps, Olive, goddess-like in loveliness, looking down with a slight frown on her forehead. Olive, beautiful, insolent. Her full form voluptuous in its swathings of rose silk and lace. Her golden-brown hair curling richly under her big, white-frilled hat. Her color ripe and melting. Beautiful, thought Valency coolly, but, as if she suddenly saw her cousin through new eyes, without the slightest touch of distinction. So Valency had come home, thank goodness, thought Olive. But Valency was not looking like a repentant, returned prodigal. This was the cause of Olive's frown. She was looking triumphant, graceless. That outlandish dress, that queer hat, those hands full of blood-red roses. Yet there was something about both dress and hat, as Olive instantly felt, that was entirely lacking in her own attire. This deepened the frown. She put out a condescending hand. So you're back, Doss? Very warm day, isn't it? Did you walk in? Yes. Coming in? Oh, no. I've just been in. I've come often to comfort poor auntie. She's been so lonesome. I'm going to Mrs. Bartlett's tea. I have to help poor. She's giving it for her cousin from Toronto. Such a charming girl. You'd have loved meeting her, Doss. I think Mrs. Bartlett did send you a card. Perhaps you'll drop in later on. No, I don't think so, said Valency indifferently. I'll have to be home to get Barney's supper. We're going for a moonlit canoe ride around Mistawi's tonight. Barney? Supper, gasped Olive. What do you mean, Valency Sterling? Valency Snaith, by the grace of God. Valency flaunted her wedding ring in Olive's stricken face. Then she nimbly stepped past her and into the house. Cousin Georgiana followed. She would not miss a moment of the great scene, even though Olive did look as if she were going to faint. Olive did not faint. She went stupidly down the street to Mrs. Bartlett's. What did Doss mean? She couldn't have, that ring, oh, what fresh scandal was that wretched girl bringing on her defenseless family now? She should have been, shut up, long ago. Valency opened the sitting room door and stepped unexpectedly right into a grim assemblage of Sterlings. They had not come together of malice prepense. Aunt Wellington and Cousin Gladys and Aunt Mildred and Cousin Sarah had just called in on their way home from a meeting of the Missionary Society. Uncle James had dropped in to give Amelia some information regarding a doubtful investment. Uncle Benjamin had called, apparently, to tell them it was a hot day and ask them what was the difference between a bee and a donkey. Cousin Stickles had been tactless enough to know the answer, one gets all the honey, the other all the wax, and Uncle Benjamin was in a bad humor. In all of their minds, unexpressed, was the idea of finding out if Valency had yet come home, and, if not, what steps must be taken in the matter. Well, here was Valency at last, a poised, confident thing, not humble and deprecating as she should have been. And so oddly, improperly young-looking. She stood in the doorway and looked at them, cousin Georgiana timorous, expectant, behind her. Valency was so happy she didn't hate her people any more. She could even see a number of good qualities in them that she had never seen before. And she was sorry for them. 
Her pity made her quite gentle. Well, mother, she said pleasantly. So you've come home at last, said Mrs. Frederick, getting out a handkerchief. She dared not be outraged, but she did not mean to be cheated of her tears. Well, not exactly, said Valency. She threw her bomb. I thought I ought to drop in and tell you I was married. Last Tuesday night. To Barney Snaith. Uncle Benjamin bounced up and sat down again. God bless my soul, he said dully. The rest seemed turned to stone. Except Cousin Gladys, who turned faint. Aunt Mildred and Uncle Wellington had to help her out to the kitchen. She would have to keep up the Victorian traditions, said Valency, with a grin. She sat down, uninvited, on a chair. Cousin Stickles had begun to sob. Is there one day in your life that you haven't cried? asked Valency curiously. Valency, said Uncle James, being the first to recover the power of utterance, did you mean what you said just now? I did. Do you mean to say that you have actually gone and married, married, that notorious Barney Snaith, that, that, criminal, that, I have? Then, said Uncle James violently, you are a shameless creature, lost to all sense of propriety and virtue, and I wash my hands entirely of you. I do not want ever to see your face again. What have you left to say when I commit murder? asked Valency. Uncle Benjamin again appealed to God to bless his soul. That drunken outlaw, that, a dangerous spark appeared in Valency's eyes. They might say what they liked to and of her but they should not abuse Barney. Say, damn, and you'll feel better, she suggested. I can express my feelings without blasphemy. And I tell you have covered yourself with eternal disgrace and infamy by marrying that drunkard, you would be more endurable if you got drunk occasionally. Barney is not a drunkard. He was seen drunk in Port Lawrence, pickled to the gills, said Uncle Benjamin. If that is true, and I don't believe it, he had a good reason for it. Now I suggest that you all stop looking tragic and accept the situation. I'm married, you can't undo that. And I'm perfectly happy. I suppose we ought to be thankful he has really married her, said Cousin Sarah, by way of trying to look on the bright side. If he really has, said Uncle James, who had just washed his hands of Valency. Who married you? Mr. Towers, of Port Lawrence. By a free Methodist, groaned Mrs. Frederick, as if to have been married by an imprisoned Methodist would have been a shade less disgraceful. It was the first thing she had said. Mrs. Frederick didn't know what to say. The whole thing was too horrible, too nightmarish. She was sure she must wake up soon. After all their bright hopes at the funeral. It makes me think of those what do you call EMS, said Uncle Benjamin helplessly. Those yarns, you know, of fairies taking babies out of their cradles. Valency could hardly be a changeling at twenty-nine, said Aunt Wellington satirically. She was the oddest-looking baby I ever saw, anyway, averred Uncle Benjamin. I said so at the time, you remember, Amelia? I said I had never seen such eyes in a human head. I'm glad I never had any children, said Cousin Sarah. If they don't break your heart in one way they do it in another. Isn't it better to have your heart broken than to have it wither up?" queried Valency. Before it could be broken it must have felt something splendid. That would be worth the pain. Dippy, clean Dippy, muttered Uncle Benjamin, with a vague, unsatisfactory feeling that somebody had said something like that before. Valency, said Mrs. Frederick solemnly, do you ever pray to be forgiven for disobeying your mother? I should pray to be forgiven for obeying you so long, said Valency stubbornly. But I don't pray about that at all. I just thank God every day for my happiness. I would rather, said Mrs. Frederick, beginning to cry rather belatedly, see you dead before me than listen to what you have told me today. Valency looked at her mother and aunts, and wondered if they could ever have known anything of the real meaning of love. She felt sorrier for them than ever. They were so very pitiable. 
and they never suspected it. Barney Snaith is a scoundrel to have deluded you into marrying him, said Uncle James violently. Oh, I did the deluding. I asked him to marry me, said Valency, with a wicked smile. Have you no pride, demanded Aunt Wellington. Lots of it. I am proud that I have achieved a husband by my own unaided efforts. Cousin Georgiana here wanted to help me to Edward Beck. Edward Beck is worth $20,000 and has the finest house between here and Port Lawrence, said Uncle Benjamin. That sounds very fine, said Valency scornfully, but it isn't worth that, she snapped her fingers, compared to feeling Barney's arms around me and his cheek against mine. Oh, Doss, said Cousin Stickles. Cousin Sarah said, oh, Doss. Aunt Wellington said, Valency, you need not be indecent. Why, it surely isn't indecent to like to have your husband put his arm around you. I should think it would be indecent if you didn't. Why expect decency from her, inquired Uncle James sarcastically. She has cut herself off from decency forevermore. She has made her bed. Let her lie on it. Thanks, said Valency very gratefully. How you would have enjoyed being Torquemada. Now, I must really be getting back. Mother, may I have those three woolen cushions I worked last winter? Take them, take everything, said Mrs. Frederick. Oh, I don't want everything, or much. I don't want my blue castle cluttered. Just the cushions. I'll call for them some day when we motor in. Valency rose and went to the door. There she turned. She was sorrier than ever for them all. They had no blue castle in the purple solitudes of Mistawis. The trouble with you people is that you don't laugh enough, she said. Doss, dear, said Cousin Georgiana mournfully, some day you will discover that blood is thicker than water. Of course it is. But who wants water to be thick, parried Valency. We want water to be thin, sparkling, crystal clear. Cousin Stickles groaned. Valency would not ask any of them to come and see her, she was afraid they would come out of curiosity. But she said, do you mind if I drop in and see you once in a while, mother? My house will always be open to you, said Mrs. Frederick, with a mournful dignity. You should never recognize her again, said Uncle James sternly, as the door closed behind Valency. I cannot quite forget that I am a mother, said Mrs. Frederick. My poor, unfortunate girl. I dare say the marriage isn't legal, said Uncle James comfortingly. He has probably been married half a dozen times before. But I am through with her. I have done all I could, Amelia. I think you will admit that. Henceforth, Uncle James was terribly solemn about it, Valency is to me as one dead. Mrs. Barney Snaith, said Cousin Georgiana, as if trying it out to see how it would sound. He has a score of aliases, no doubt, said Uncle Benjamin. For my part, I believe the man is half Indian. I haven't a doubt they're living in a wigwam. If he has married her under the name of Snaith and it isn't his real name wouldn't that make the marriage null and void?" asked Cousin Stickles hopefully. Uncle James shook his head. No, it is the man who marries, not the name. You know, said Cousin Gladys, who had recovered and returned but was still shaky, I had a distinct premonition of this at Herbert's silver dinner. I remarked it at the time. When she was defending Snaith. You remember, of course. It came over me like a revelation. I spoke to David when I went home about it. What, what, demanded Aunt Wellington of the universe, has come over Valency. Valency. The universe did not answer but Uncle James did. Isn't there something coming up of late about secondary personalities cropping out? I don't hold with many of those newfangled notions, but there may be something in this one. It would account for her incomprehensible conduct. Valency is so fond of mushrooms, sighed Cousin Georgiana. I'm afraid she'll get poisoned eating toadstools by mistake living up back in the woods. There are worse things than death, 
said Uncle James, believing that it was the first time in the world that such a statement had been made. Nothing can ever be the same again, sobbed Cousin Stickles. Valency, hurrying along the dusty road, back to cool Mastawis and her purple island, had forgotten all about them, just as she had forgotten that she might drop dead at any moment if she hurried. 